As I remember, madam, it was upon this question. My father bequeathed me by will but four thousand crowns and charged my brother on his blessing to breed me well. And there begins my sadness. He stays me at home unkept. For call you that keeping for a gentleman of my birth that differs not from the stalling of an ox? He lets me feed with his hinds, bars me the place of a brother, and as much as in him lies, minds my gentility with my education. This is it, Adam, that grieves me, and the spirit of my father, which I think is within me, begins to mutiny against this servitude. I will no longer endure it. Stay apart, and thou shalt hear how he will shake me out. Now, sir, what make you here? Nothing. I am not taught to make anything. Marry, sir, be better employed. Shall I keep your hogs and eat husks with them? Know you where you are, sir? I know you are my eldest brother. And in the gentle condition of blood, you should so know me. I have as much of my father in me as you. What? Boy! Come, come, elder brother, you are too young. What? The swift away hands of me, villain! I am no villain. I am the youngest son of Sir Roland the boys. And he is thrice a villain that says such a father begot villains. Wert thou not my brother, I would not take this hand from thy throat till this other head pulled out thy tongue for saying so. Sweet masters, be patient. For your father's remembrance be your to go. Let me go, I say. I will not till I please. You shall hear me. My father charged you by his will to give me good education. You have trained me like a peasant, and the spirit of my father grows strong within me, and I will no longer endure it. Therefore, give me the poor allotted that my father left me my testament. With that, I will go buy my fortune. Well, sir, get you in. I will not long be troubled with you. You shall have some part of your will. I pray you leave me. I will no further offend you than becomes me for my good. Get you with it, you old dog. Oh, dog, my lord. Most true, I have lost my teeth in thy service. I know you think you are righteous, and yet give no thousand crowns neither. Was not Charles, the Duke's Reisler, here to speak with me? So please you, he is here at the door. Call him in. What's the new news, the new court? There is no news at the court, sir, but the old news. That is, the old duke is banished by his younger brother, the new duke. Where will the old duke live? They say he's already in the forest of Arden, and uh, many, many men with him, and there they live like the old Robin Hood of England. You wrestle tomorrow before the new duke. Mary, why, sir? And I think to acquaint you with the matter. I am given, sir, secretly to understand that your younger brother Orlando comes against me to try all. Tomorrow, sir, I wrestle for my credit, and he that escapes me without some broken limb shall acquit him well. And therefore, out of my love to you, I came hither to acquaint you that you might stay him. Oh. I thank thee for thy love to me, which I will most kindly require. I tell thee, Charles, my brother is the stubbornest young fellow of France, a secret and villainous contriver against me, his natural brother. Therefore, use thy discretion. 
I was leaving out its break his neck as his finger. I'm heartily glad I came hither to you. If he come tomorrow, I'll give him his payment. If ever he go alone again, I'll never wrestle for prize war. And so God keep your worship. Farewell, my child. will not be entreated, his own pillow and his forwardness. Is yonder the man? Did he, madame? Alas, he is too young. How now, daughter and cousin? Are you quite here to see the wrestling? I, my liege. So please you give us leave. You will take little delight in it, I can tell you there is such odds in the man. In pity of the challenger's youth, I would fain dissuade him, but he will not be entreated. Speak to him, ladies. See if you can move him. I will not be by. Call him hither, good Monsieur Le Beau. 
Monsieur the challenger, the princess calls for you. I attend them with all respect and duty. Young man, have you challenged Charles the wrestler? No, fair princess. He is the general challenger. I come but in as others do to try with him the strength of my youth. Young gentlemen, your spirits are too well for your years. We pray you for your own sake to give over this attempt. Do you sir? I beseech you, punish me not with your hard thoughts, wherein I confess me much guilty to deny so fair and excellent lady as anything. But let your fair eyes and gentle wishes go with me to my trial, wherein, if I be foiled, there is but one shame to was never gracious. If killed, but one dead that is willing to be so. I shall do my friends no wrong, for I have none to lament me. The world no injury, for in it I have nothing. Only in the world I fill up a place which may be better supplied when I have made it empty. A little strength I have, I would it were with you, and mine to eke out hers. You should not have mocked me before, but come your way. You must be thy speed, young man. I would I were invisible to catch the strong fellow by the neck. been sung to some man else. The world esteemed thy father honorable, but I did find him still my enemy. But fare thee well, thou art a gallant. I would thou hadst told me of another father.
time my father comes. Would I do this? My father loved to Roland as his soul. Gentle cousin, let us go thank him and encourage him. Sir, you have well deserved. If you do keep your promises in love but justly as you have exceeded promise, your mistress shall be happy. Gentlemen, wear this for me. One out of suits with fortune that could give more but that her hand lacks means. Shall we go, cousin? Aye. Very well, fair gentlemen. Can I not say thank you? He calls us there. My pride fell with my fortune. I'll ask him what he would. Did you call, sir? Sir, you are castled well and overthrown more than your enemies. Will you go, Rosalind? Have with you. Fare you well. What passion hangs these weights upon my tongue? I cannot speak to her. Yet she urged comforts. Oh, poor Orlando, thou art overthrown. Or Charles, or something weaker, masters thee. Good sir, I do in friendship counsel you to leave this place. All yet you have deserved high commendation. Yet, such is now the Duke's condition that he misconstrues all that you have done. I thank you, sir. And pray you tell me this. Which of the two was daughter of the Duke that here was at the rescue? Indeed, the daughter is his daughter. The other is Rosalie, daughter to the banished Duke. But I can tell you that of late this Duke hath gained displeasure against his gentle niece, grounded upon no other argument, but that the people praise her for her virtues and pity her for her good father's sake. And on my life, his manuscripts and this lady will suddenly break forth. Sir, fare you well. I rest much bound unto you. Fare you well. Thus must I from the smoke into the smother. From tyrant duke unto a tyrant brother. But heavenly was it. Mistress, dispatch you with your safest haste and get you from our court. You, cousin. You, cousin. Within these ten days, if the thou beast found so near our public court as twenty miles, thou diest for it. I do beseech your grace. 
Let me the knowledge of my thought bear with me. Never so much as in a thought I'm born did I offend your highness. Thus do all traitors. Thou art thy father's daughter, there's enough. So was I, when your highness took his dukedom. So was I, when your highness banished him. Treason is not inherited, my lord. Or if we did derive it from our friends, what's that to me? My father was no traitor. Then good my liege mistake me not so much to think my poverty is treacherous. Dear sovereign, hear me speak. Why, Celia, we stay her for your sake, else had she with her father ranged along. If she be a traitor, why so am I? We still have slept together, rose to an instant, learned, played, ate together. Still we went coupling and inseparable. Lord, she wants to be me. Being bright and seem more virtuous when she is gone. No, I don't. Oh, okay, yes. Firm and irrevocable is my doom. She is buried. Pronounce that sentence that on me, my niece. I cannot live out of her company. You are a fool. You, niece, provide yourself. If you are stay the time upon my honor and in the greatness of my word, you die.
that did but lately foil the sinewy Charles, and she believes wherever they are gone, that youth is surely in their company. Send for that wrestler. Fetch that gallant hither. If he be Edward, bring his brother to me. I'll make him find him. Do this suddenly. And let not such our inquisition fail to bring again these foolish runaways. Oh, you'll never hear of old Sir Roland. 
Why, what's the matter? Oh, have we present the truth, the enemy of all your graces lives, your brother. This night he means to burn the lodging where you lose for life, and you within it. This house is but a butchery. Of all it, fear it. Do not stay in it. Why, whither Adam wouldst thou have me go? No matter whither, so you stay not here. What, wouldst thou have me go and beg my food? I have five hundred crowns. The thrifty eye I seek down to your father. Here is the gold. All this I give you. Let me be your servant in all your business and necessities. Oh, good old man. How well indeed appears the constant service of the antique world, where service sweat for duty, not for me. Thou art not for the fashion of these times, where none will serve but for promotion. But come thy ways, we'll go along together, and ere we have thy youthful wages spent, we'll light upon some settled low content. <laughs> into a thousand that I have forgotten. Oh, thou didst then ne'er love so heartily. If thou rememberest not the slightest folly that ever thou did make thee run into, thou hast not loved. <laughs> or if thou hast not spoken as I do now, wearing thy hero with thy mistress praise, thou hast not loved. <laughs> Or if thou hast not broke from company, abruptly, as my fashion now makes me, thou hast not loved. <laughs> oh, Phoebe, Phoebe, Phoebe. Oh, Joe, Joe, this shepherd's passion is much upon my passion. And uh, mine. But it grows somewhat stale with me. I pray you, one of you, question your man if he for gold will give us any food. I pray you all with the girl. <laughs> oh, no, you clown. Peace, fool, he's not thy kinsman. Who calls? Oh, no, you pray. And to you, gentle sir, 
And to you all. I pray, Shepherd, if the love of gold can in this desert place buy entertainment, here's a young maid who tried to much a place and faints for supper. Fair sir, I pity her, but I am shepherd to another man and do not share the fleeces that I graze, his cot, his flocks, and bounds of feed are now on sale. But what is? Come and see, and in my voice most welcome shall you be. I pray thee, if it stands with honesty by thou the cottage, pasture, and the flock, then thou shalt have to pay for it of us. I like this place, and, and willingly would waste my time in it. Assuredly, the thing is to be sold. Go with me, and if you like upon report the soil, the profit, and this kind of life, I will your very faithful leader be. Hi, how now, monsieur? What a life is this that your poor friends must woo your company? Uh, you look merrily. A fool, a fool. <laughs> I met a fool in the forest. <laughs> a motley <laughs> fool. <laughs> a miserable world. <laughs> As I do live by food, I met a fool <laughs> who laid him down and basked him in the sun and railed on Lady Fortune in good terms, in good set terms, <laughs> and yet a motley fool. <laughs> <laughs> good morrow, fool, quoth I. No, sir, quoth he. Call me not fool till heaven hath sent me fortune. <laughs> and then he drew a dial from his poke, and looking on it with lackluster eye, says very wisely, It is ten o'clock. Thus we may see, quoth he, how the world wags. Tis but an hour ago since it was nine, and after one hour more to the eleven. And so from hour to hour we write and ripe, and then from hour to hour we rot and rot, and thereby hangs a tale. A <laughs> <laughs> oh, noble fool, a worthy fool, Motley's the only way. <laughs> <laughs> what fool is this? Oh, worthy fool, <laughs> would that I were a fool. I am ambitious for a motley coat. For <laughs> <laughs> oh, there, and eat no more. Why, I met none yet, nor shalt not to necessity be servant. Of what kind should this cock come on? For well, there I say! He dies who touches any of this fruit till I and my affair are answer it. And you will not be answered with reason. And to die. What would you have? Your gentleness shall force more than your force move us to gentleness. I always die for food. Let me have it. Sit down and feed. And welcome to our table. Speak you so gently. Pardon me, I pray you. I thought that all things had been savage here. And therefore put I on the countenance of stern commandment. But whate'er you are, if ever you have looked on better days, if ever been where bells have known to church, if ever sat at any good man's feast, if ever from your eyelids wipe a tear and know what is to pity and be pitied, let gentleness my strong enforcement be, in the which hope I blush and hide my soul. True is it that we have seen better days, and have with holy bell been known to church, and sat at good men's feasts, and wiped our eyes of drops that sacred pity hath engendered. Therefore, sit you down in gentleness. Yet but forbear your food a little while. There is a poor old man who after me hath many a weary step limped in pure love, till he be first sufficed, oppressed with two weak evils, age and hunger. I will not touch a bit. Go seek him out, and we will nothing waste of your return. I thank you, and be blessed for your good comfort. Thou seest. We are not all alone unhappy. This wide and universal theater presents more woeful pageants than the scene wherein we play it. 
all the world the stage and all the men and women merely players they have their exits and their entrances and one man in his time plays many parts his acts being seven ages at first the infant mewling and puking in the nurse's arms then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face creeping like snail unwillingly to school and then the lover sighing like the furnace with a woeful ballad made to his mistress eyebrow then a soldier full of strange oaths and bearded like the bard jealous in honor sudden and quick in quarrel seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth and then the justice in fair round belly with good cape and lined with eyes severe and beard of form cut full of wise saws and modern instances and so he plays his part the sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon with spectacles on nose and pouch on side his youthful hose well saved a world too wide for his shrunk shank and his big manly voice turning again to a childish treble pipes and whistles in his sound last scene of all that ends this strange eventful history is second childishness and mere oblivion sonorous teeth sonorous eyes sonorous taste sonorous everything If that you were the good Sir Roland's son, as you have whispered faithfully you were, be truly welcome hither. Good old man, thou art right welcome as thy master is. I am the Duke that loved your father. Not seen him since, sir, sir, there cannot be. But look to it. Find out thy brother, wheresoever he is. Seek him in candle. Bring him dead or living within this twelve months, or turn thou no more to seek a living in our territory. Thy lands and all things that thou dost call thine worth seizure, do we seize into our hands, till thou canst quit thee by thy brother's mouth of what we think against thee. Oh, that your highness knew my heart in this. I never loved my brother in my life. More villain thou. Well, push him out of court. And let my officers of such a nature make an extent of his house and lands. Do this expedient there, turn him good. Queen of Knights, away with thy chaste eye from thy pale sphere above, thy huntress name that my full life doth sway. O oh, Rosalind, these trees shall be my books, and in their barks my thoughts I'll carry to. 
that every eye which in this forest looks shall see thy virtue witnessed everywhere. Run, run, Orlando. Carve on every tree the fair, the chaste, the unexpressive she. Thank you. 
know I'm comparison like a man, I have a gun that holes in my disposition. One means of delay war in the South Sea of discovery. Quickly and speak a pace. Oh, I would thou be stammer. That thou might pour this concealed man out of thy mouth as wine comes out of an animal bottle. I was too much at once or none at all. I bring thee, take the cork out of thy mouth, that I may drink thy wine. So you may put a man in your head. What manner of man? It is head the head, for his chin got a beard. Nay. He had but a little beard. Why? God will send more at the man to be thankful. Let me stay in the growth of his beard, if thou be in not the knowledge of his chin. It is. Yeah, yeah, ooh. Orlando. Orlando? Orlando. Very last day. What shall I do with my love in the What did he do when thou saw us there? What's there? How look? What makes he here? Did he ask for me? Oh, did thou see him again? Oh, answer me in one word. He was barmy gag and to his mouth first. Ooh. I take it. I found him under a tree, like a dropped acorn. May well be called Job's tree, when it drops forth such fruit. There lay he, stretched along like a wounded nut. Though it be pity to see such a sight. It well becomes the ground. How hard to thy tongue, my pretty. Thou brings me up too. Oh, Elena! Elena! Do you not know I'm a woman? When I think I must speak. Sweet day on. No, you bring me up. And so had I. But yet for fashion's sake, I thank you too for your society. God be with you. Let's meet as little as we can. I do desire we may be better strangers. I pray you, mar no more trees with writing love songs in their barks. I pray you, mar no more of my verses with reading them in favor of them. Rosalind is your love's name. Yes, just. I do not like her name. There was no fault of pleasing you when she was christened. What stature is she of? Just as high as my heart. You're full of pretty answers. I am weary of you. I'll tarry no longer with you. Farewell, good senior love. I am glad of your departure. Adieu, good Monsieur Melancholy. Hola, Forrester, who you here? Very well, what would you? I pray you, what is the clock? You should ask what time of day. There is no clock in the forest. And there is no true lover in the forest. Else tying every minute and groaning every hour would detect the lazy foot of time as well as the clock. Where dwell you, pretty you? With this shepherdess, my sister. Here in the skirts of the forest lie fringe upon a petticoat. Your accent is something finer than could purchase in so removed a dwelling. I have been told for men, <clears throat> but indeed an old religious uncle of mine taught me to speak. He was in his youth an inland man, one that knew courtship too well, for there he fell in love. I have heard him read many lectures against it, and I thank God I am not a woman to be touched with so many giddy offenses. Can you remember any of the principal evils that he laid for charge of women? I pray that we can't some of them. No. I will not cast away my physic and those that are sick. There is a man haunts the forest and abuses our young plants with carving Rosalind on their barks, hangs on 
feeds upon hawthorns and empties on brambles. And all forsooth, defying the name of Rosalind. If I could meet that cantimonger, now I would give him some good counsel, for he seems to have the quotidian of love on him. I am he that is so love shaped. I pray you tell me your remedy. There is none of my uncle's marks upon me. He taught me how to know a man in love. What were his marks? Oh. A new cheek, which you have not. A blue eye and sunken, which you have not. A beard neglected, which you have not. Then your hoards should be unguarded. Your bonnet unbanded. Your sleeve unbuttoned, your shoe untied. And everything about you demonstrating a careless desolation. But you are no such man. You are rather quaint device in your accoutrements, as loving yourself and seeming the lover of any other. I swear to thee, youth, by the white hand of Rosalind, I am that he, that unfortunate he. But are you as much in love as your eyes speak? Neither rhyme nor reason can express how much. Love is merely a madness, yet I profess curing it by counsel. Did you ever cure any so? Mm -hmm. One. And in this manner, he was to imagine me his love, his mistress. And I set him every day to woo me. At which time I, being but a moonish youth, would now like him, now loathe him, then entertain him, then forswear him, now weep for him, now spit at him, that I brave my suitor from his mad humor of love into a living humor of madness. And that I cure him. And this way would I take upon me to wash your liver as clean as a sound sheep's heart, that there shall not be one spot of love in it. I would not be cured, you. But I would cure you. If you would but call me Rosalind, and come back today to my cot to woo me. Now by the faith of my love, I will. Tell me where it is. Go with me, and I'll show it you. And by the way, you can tell me where in the forest you live. Will you go? With all my heart, could you? Nay, you must call me Rosalind. Rosalind. Content you? Lord Wanda, what features? <laughs> Truly, I would the gods had made thee poetical. I do not know what poetical is. <laughs> is it honest in word and deed? Nay, truly, for the truest poetry is the most fading. You wish then that the gods had made me poetical? I do, <laughs> truly. For thou swearest to me thou art honest. Now, if thou wert a poet, I might have some hope thou didst fail. Would you not have me honest? Nay, truly, unless thou wert hard favor. <laughs> <laughs> Yet have the grace to consider that tears do not become a man. But have I not cause to weep? As good a cause as one would desire. Therefore weep. His very hair is of dissembling color. Even browner than Judas's. Mary's, his kisses are Judas's own children. His hair is of a good color. An excellent color. 
Your chestnut was ever the only colour. And his kissing is as full of sanctity as the touch of holy bread. The very ice of chastity is in them. But why, why did he swear I would come this morning and comes not? No, certainly. There is no truth in him. No true in love? Yes, when he is in. But I think he's not in. You have let him swear down right he was. Was is not is. Besides, the oath of a lover is no stronger than the word of a texter. He attends here in the forest on the duke, your father. Say not so in bitterness. I fly thee, for I would not injure thee. Thou tells me there is murder in mine eyes. Tis pretty sure and very probable. And if mine eyes can wound, now let them kill thee. Now come to seek the swoon. Why now fall down? Oh, if thou canst not. Oh, for shame, for shame. Lie not to say mine eyes are murderers. Oh, dear Phoebe, if ever, as that ever may be near, you meet in some fresh cheek the power of fancy, then shall you know the wounds invisible that love's keen arrows make. But till that time, come not thou near me. And when that time comes, afflict me with thy mock. Pity me not. Until that time, I shall not pity thee. And why, I pray you, who might be your mother, that you insult, exult, and all at once over the wretched. What? So you have no beauty. Must you therefore be proud and pitiless? Why? What means this? Why do you look at me? Oh, my little life. I think she means to tell you my eyes too. No. Faith, proud mistress. Hope oh, not after it. Tis not your inky brows, your black silk hair, your blue live eyes, nor your cheek of green that can entail my spirits to your worship. You foolish shepherd. Wherefore do you follow her like some south passing with wind and rain? You are a thousand times a proper man than she a woman. Tis not her glass but you that flatters her. But mistress, know yourself. Down on your knees. Thank heaven fasting for a good man's love. For I must tell you, friendly, in your ears, sell when you can. You are not for all markets. So take her to the shepherd. Very well. Sweet youth, I pray you, chide in here together. I had rather hear you chide than this man woo. I pray you do not fall in love with me, for I am falser than vows made in wine. Besides, I like you not. Come, sister, let us go. Good day and happiness, dear Rosalind. Good 
Good day and happiness, dear Rosalind. And 
so kindly. <laughs> Two o'clock is your hour. Buy my trust and be good earnest. As you go out there with me, and by all for the oath that I am dangerous, if you break but one jot of your promise, or come one minute behind your hour, I will think you the most pathetic break promise, and the most hollow lover, and the most unworthy of her you call Rosalind. Therefore, beware and keep your promise. With no less religion than if that was indeed my Rosalind. So adieu. Adieu. He calls his Rosalind. He sends this bloodstained napkin. Are you he? I am. What must we understand by this? Some of my shame. If you know of me what man I am, and how and why and where this handkerchief was stained. I pray you tell it. When last year Orlando parted from you, he left a promise to return again within the hour. And piecing through the forest, lo what befell. Under an oak, a wretched ragged man lay sleeping on his back. About his neck, a green and gilded snake had relieved itself. But suddenly seeing Orlando, it unlinked itself and slipped away into a bush. Under which bush is shade, a lion is lay crouching, head on ground with cat-like watch, when the sleeping man should stir. This scene, Orlando did approach the man, and found it was his brother, his elder brother. 
Oh, I've heard him speak of that same brother. And he did render him the most unnatural that lived amongst men. And well might he so you. For well I know he was unnatural. But for Orlando, did he leave him there? Twice did he turn his back and purpose so. But kindness, nobler ever than revenge, made him give battle to the lioness, which quickly fell before him. In which hurtling from miserable slumber I awake. Are you his brother? Must you be rescued? Must you that did so often contrive to kill him? Was I. But tis not I. I do not shame to tell you what I was, since my conversion so sweetly tastes being the thing I am. But for this blood-stained napkin? I lie. When, from the first to last, betwixt us two, tears our recompense had most kindly made, as how I came into that desert place. In brief, he led me to the gentle duke, who gave me fresh array and entertainment, committing me unto my brother's love, who led me instantly into his cave, there stripped himself. And here, upon his arm, the lioness had torn some flesh away, which all this while had bled. And now he fainted, and cried and fainted upon Rosalind. Many will swoon when they do look on blood. There is more in it. Cousin, give me meat. Look here, Cuthbert. I will not We will lead you thither. I pray you, will you take him by the arm? Be of good cheer, you. You are man. You lack a man's heart. I do so. I confess it. I pray you, sir, tell your brother how well accounted it. This is not counterfeit. There is too great testimony in your complexion. It's a passion of earnest. Counterfeit, I assure you. <laughs> <laughs> well, then take a good heart and counterfeit to be a man. So I, I do. But the faith I should have been a woman by right. Come, you look paler and paler. Pray you draw homewards. Good sir, go with her. That will I. It is meat and drink to me to meet a clown. We shall be flouty. We cannot hold. Good even, Audrey. Got you good even, William. Yeah. And good even to you, sir. Good even, gentle friend. Cover thy head, cover thy head. Nay, prithee, be covered. How old are you, friend? Five and twenty, sir. A ripe age. Is thy name William? William, sir. A fair name. Wast born near the forest here? Aye, sir, I thank God. Thank God. A good answer. Art thou wise? Aye, sir, I have a pretty wit. Faith, thou sayest well. I do not remember a saying, the fool doth think he is wise, but the wise man knows himself to be a fool. You do love this maid. <laughs> I do, sir. Give me your hand. <laughs> Art thou learning? No, sir. Then learn this of me. To have is to have, for it is a figure in rhetoric that drink being poured out of a cup into a glass, by filling the one doth empty the other, and all your writers do consent that Ipse is he. Now you are not he. Because I am he. Uh, which he, sir? He, sir, that must marry this woman. Therefore, you clown, abandon the society of this female, or clown, thou perishest, or, to thy better understanding, diest, or to wit, I kill thee, make thee away, translate thy life into death, I will kill thee a hundred and fifty ways. Therefore, tremble and depart. Do good, William. God bless you, Mary, sir.
this to possible but on so little acquaintance, that but seeing Eliana you should love her, and loving woo and wooing she should groan. Neither call in question my sudden wooing nor her sudden consent. But say with me, I love Eliana. Let your wedding be tomorrow. Thither will I invite the Duke and all his contented followers. Go you and prepare the end. It is my arm. I thought thy heart had been wounded by the claws of a lion. Wounded it is, but with the eyes of a lady. Did your brother tell you how I counterfeited the swoon when he showed me your handkerchief? Aye, and greater wonders than that. Oh, I know where you are. Nay, it is true, there was never anything so sudden. For your brother and my sister, they are in the very warmth of love. They will together. Clouds cannot part. They shall be married tomorrow. And I will bid the Duke to the nuptial. But oh, how bitter a thing it is to look into happiness through another man's eyes. By so much the more shall I tomorrow be at the height of hard heavens. By how much I shall think my brother happy in having what he wishes for. Why then? Tomorrow I cannot serve your turn for Rosalind. I can live no longer by thinking. I will weary you then no longer with idle talking. Know of me then that I can do strange things. I have, uh, since I was three years old, conversed with a magician. And if you do like Rosalind so near the heart as your gesture cries out, you shall marry her when your brother marries Eliana. It is not impossible for me to set her before your eyes tomorrow, human as she is, and without any danger. Speak down sober meaning. I do, by my life, which I tender dearly, though I say I am a magician. Therefore, put you on your best friend. Bid your best friends. For if you will be married tomorrow, you shall. And to Rosalind, if you will. You, you have done me much ungentleness. I care not if I am. It is my study to seem despiteful and ungentle to you. You are there followed by a faithful shepherd. Look upon him, love him, he worships you. Good shepherd, tell this youth what is to love. It is to be all made of sighs and tears. And so am I for Phoebe. And I for Ganymede. And I for Rosalind. And I for no woman. It is to be all made of faith and service. And so am I for Phoebe. And I for Ganymede. And I for Rosalind. And I for no woman. It is to be all made of fantasy, all made of passion, and all made of wishes, all adoration, duty, and observance, all humbleness, all patience, and impatience, all purity, all trial, and all obedience. And so am I for Phoebe. And so am I for Ganymede. And so am I for Rosalind. And so am I for no woman. Pray you no more of this. Tis like the howling of Irish wolves against the moon. I will help you if I can. I would love you if I could. Tomorrow, meet me all together. I will marry you if ever I marry you. And I will marry tomorrow. I'll satisfy you if ever I satisfy man. And you shall be married tomorrow. I'll content you if what pleases you contents you. 
and you will be married tomorrow. As you love Rosalind, meet. As you love Phoebe, meet. And as I love no woman, I'll meet. So fare you well, I've left you command. I'll not fail if I live. No, I. Nor I. They have audience for a word or two. Duke Frederick, hearing how that every day men of great worth resorted to this forest, addressed a mighty power which were on foot in his own conduct, purposely to take his brother here and put him to the sword. 
and to the skirts of this wild wood he came, where, meeting with an old religious man, after some question with him, was converted both from his enterprise and from the world, his crown bequeathing to his banished brother, and all their land restored to them again that were with him exiled. <laughs> Welcome, young man. Thou offerest fairly to my daughter's wedding. Meantime, forget this new fallen dignity and fall into our rustic revelry. <laughs> proceed, proceed. We will begin these rites as we do trust they lend in true delight. <laughs> And neither a good epilogue nor cannot insinuate with you in the behalf of a good play. I am not furnished like a beggar. Therefore, to beg will not be kindly. My way is to conjure you. And I'll begin with the women. I charge you, O oh women, for the love of bear to men to like as much of this play as please you. And I charge you, O oh men, for the love you bear to women, that between you and the women the play may please The described and captioned media program provides services designed to benefit students who are blind, visually impaired, deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind. These services include a library of free loan described and captioned educational media, a clearinghouse of information related to educational media access, a gateway to internet resources related to accessibility, and a center for training and evaluation of any service provider desiring to appear on the DCMP's approved list of description and captioning service providers. There are no user registration or service fees. Visit the DCMP at dcmp.org. The DCMP is funded by the U.S. Department of Education and administered by the National Association of the Deaf.